Here's a bigger dump. Hi guys. Alright, welcome to chapter 12, I believe. Good lord, are we at chapter 12 already of Peruvian Plunge? We're going to title this chapter simply The Birds and the Bees. And uh, we're going to start off with... Uh, I'm going to put this little dog up because he keeps messing my computer scrolling. <sighs> we're going to kick off the birds and the bees with a quote for this interesting little... I don't know, is this a book or not? The Handbook for the New Paradigm. I like this quote. <clears throat> As the acceptance of the future plan for this planet has come into your understanding, the failure of the people to grasp this and their refusal to believe its existence has caused you to face many a discouraging hour. Yet, you have continued on with the spreading of the truth. Those that have read and informed themselves shall be asked to inform and explain. Faithful tellers of the awful tale, you are the avatars of this time. And this time being Wednesday, June 3rd, 2009 at Manu Wildlife Center. The raucous squawks of, rambunct of a rambunctious flock of macaws heralded in a spectacular blue-skyed morning as I drank in the sight of a sun-splashed jungle teasing me from just outside Boa's ripped screen. I hurried to the dining room to throw down a quick cup of coffee before heading back to the canopy to see what magical adventures awaited me there on such a gorgeous day. A quick glance at the daily planned activity board threw a bucket of water over my good mood. A group of six eco-tourists had reserved the canopy tower that morning, and another group had it tied up that afternoon. No! I could see where this shit was heading. Every morning and again every afternoon, a group of paying guests would be heading over the bridge into the woods. Only one trail headed into that section of woods, however. When it got there, it branched out in six different directions. Theoretically, and most likely, tourists would begin their day in the tower around 9 a.m., but then who the hell knew where they would head to next? It could very easily happen that they wouldn't be back until noon, leaving the canopy unoccupied for more than two hours. The trap was that I couldn't risk taking the trail to the tower because I could surprise the bunch of tourists on the trail who, as we all know, would not give a shit, thereby eliciting the wrath of the guide who then would take his complaint to the Scrooge's Curtsita, and I would have living hell to pay. Christ, what a bunch of fucking drama over nothing. <clears throat> there has to be a way around this, I thought, poring over the map of the lodge and the tiny library. And there was as long as I didn't mind wading through a snake and piranha infested creek for a few feet, which I didn't. This surreptitious route through the backwoods and up the creek landed me on a small bitch, I mean small beach, that I immediately christened Playa de Mariposa, Butterfly Beach. Swarming over the sun-warm sand, there must have been two dozen butterflies from a half dozen species. <clears throat> Black, white, red, green, blue, a mass of wings of all shapes and sizes fluttered about and crawled upon the wet sand, rolling and unrolling their proboscis as they tested the ground for whatever it was that got their little butterfly hearts in such a tizzy taper piss, most likely. 
as I sat there in this colorful cloud, I could hear the group of tourists and their blabbering guide above me in the canopy. Strangely, the thick vegetation between us seemed to both amplify and muffle the sounds at the same time. Predictably, within 30 minutes, their eco-tourists the eco-tourists had seen all they cared to see of the world from a hundred feet up a kapok tree after they had traveled thousands of miles to see it and split for greener pastures. Their footprints were still warm on the ground when I got to the bottom of the spiral staircase and began climbing vine-like to the sun bath of the canopy above. I arrived into a blinding vista of sun-drenched treetops spreading away in every direction. The tops of the huge emergence dotted the endless sea of green like so many islands, which in effect they were. The treetops were alive with birds diving and flitting about the forest, birds that had been nowhere to be seen on the previous wet days. Even though I'm not an avid bird watcher, I was relieved that I had remembered to throw in a pair of binoculars at the last minute before leaving my house in Texas months before. Where to begin in this riot of life? I spied movement at the top of a strangely white tree on the creek bank, which appeared to be directly above Playa de Mariposa. I focused my field glasses on the white tree and found that, in fact, it was a lower canopy tree that had been totally overtaken by a flowering vine which was in full bloom. The movement that had caught my eye was not coming from a flock of birds, but from the single biggest swarm of butterflies I had ever seen or imagined in my life. I thought that little spot of butterflies on the beach at ground level was impressive until I got my first glimpse of where the real butterfly action was in the rainforest. Up in the canopy, where else? Hundreds of bright butterflies swarmed over the flowers, sucking up the nectar. The eye couldn't rest on any one spot as the patterns of bright colors morphed in ever-changing rainbows. No sooner would my eye land on a butterfly the size and color of a tangerine than some neon green and black striped beauty would grab my attention. But nobody could compare to one particular day glow vermilion vision that slowly and steadily worked his way across the top ridge of flowers. The only ones missing on the scene were the more solitary giant blue morphos who apparently prefer the lower growing flowers along stream beds and seldom mix with other species. Flycatchers would dive into the swarm and pick off one butterfly after another in a feeding frenzy, but the bounty was so rich that such predation could not make a dent. A twittering flurry of excitement in my very own tree pulled my attention away from the butterflies and closer to home. All I could make out through the glare of the sun with my naked eye <clears throat> was a branch of little, was a bunch of little dots zipping around through the branch tips some 20 to 30 feet above me. Focusing in with my binoculars, these little dots morphed into one of the most brilliant little splashes of color I had ever witnessed. <clears throat> this living Christmas tree ornament was a mad mix of turquoise, violet, chartreuse, brilliant scarlet, and jet black, all rolled up into one little four-inch bird, later identified as the aptly named Paradise Tanager. 
there must have been 30 of them within a 30-foot radius of me. As I focused on one, then another, it dawned on me that there was not just one species of tanager in the tree, or even two species, but three kinds of wildly colored tanagers flitting around in one big happy flock of color. Out of this rainbow maze, one slightly larger bright yellow and orange bird that could have put the brightest canary to shame landed no more than five feet from me and stayed right there completely unafraid of me for the better part of an hour. I later identified him as a lemon-throated barbet. So this, so this story doesn't get too repetitive over the next few days, I'll jump ahead here and say that over the next 12 days, I counted well over 20 types of exotic tropical birds from my perch in the treetops, some of which include, besides the aforementioned flycatchers, paradise tanagers, and lemon-throated barbet, the following, the following, blue and yellow macaws, scarlet macaws, red and green macaws, a whole bunch of different kinds of parrots, several species of toucans, at least three kinds of woodpeckers, who knows how many kinds of hummingbirds, squirrel cuckoos, white-necked puffbirds, black-spotted barbets, shrikes, tropical kingbirds, green-eyed gold tanagers, turquoise tanagers, yellow-rumped caciques, and my personal favorite of the whole bunch, the utterly magnificent collared trogan. Google this guy for a photo so I don't spend a thousand words telling you how cool he is. It was a feathery feast that would suck me in every morning until the hot sun began driving them down to the cooler siesta of the shadows after about 10.30 a.m. I was just about to put the binoculars away and go to work writing the first word of this book you are, I hope, now reading or listening to, when literally from out of left field a troop of spider monkeys erupted from the next kapok over, perhaps 100 feet to the south, between the creek and the river. I counted six of the jet black beauties seemingly flying through the treetops as they raced toward their next meal. I hooted a hello at them. Five of them kept right on going, but one, an older male with just a touch of gray in his beard, like yours truly, slammed to a halt and stared over the creek in my direction. I waved to him and hooted again. Wanting to figure out who this strange ape was hooting at him, the spider monkey scooted down out of the leafy branches and took a seat in the crotch of two limbs. He wrapped his long furry tail around the upper of the two limbs, but let his spindly legs dangle freely over the 80-foot fall below him. He gazed directly into my eyes from his precarious perch just across the creek from me. I focused the binoculars directly on his face, looking into his intelligent dark eyes, and was carried back through the millennia, through the eons, to a place and time before humans made the evolutionary blunder of leaving behind forever our canopy-dwelling cousins to climb down from this sun-washed treetop Garden of Eden down to the shadowy ground where we have stumbled ever since making such a mess of things. Looking at that regal monkey lording over his jungle domain, just as his kind has probably been doing for a million years or more without having to destroy one tree in the process, I had to wonder, who is the real homo sapien in this equation, and who is the dumb ape? <clears throat>
Now we have a quote from Pamela Bloom in Amazon Up Close. <clears throat> the giant hunting ant is fierce and can subdue a healthy adult human with a venomous stab that is often described to feel like a blow from a hammer or bullet. Serious symptoms may follow that last a day or longer, such as prolonged aching pain that rapidly spreads from the site of the wound, sometimes labored breathing, cardiac palpitations, and fever. Death is rare. <clears throat> Before I get too carried away in my purple prose love sonnet to the rainforest, keep in mind we are talking about the Amazon jungle here, guys. I've read that one entomologist counted 42 species of ants in one giant emergent tree in Peru more than the total number of species of ants in the entire U.S. Sitting there in the canopy as the diurnal little sun worshippers cranked up for the day, I could believe it. I felt like there were 42 species of ants within six feet of me. Out of all the creepy crawlies sharing the canopy with me, none stuck more terror into my gringo heart than the dreaded Isula, or bullet, bullet ant, as it is called in English, because that is what its notorious sting is supposed to remind you of if you have the misfortune of running into this little monster. And judging by the dozens of the little black devils swarming over the platform, my chances of running into one of them were pretty good. Somehow the thought of getting nailed by something called a bullet ant ten stories up a tree half a mile from painkillers and Benadryl did not do a lot to calm my nerves. I ignored them the best I could under the circumstances and settled down to begin my tale of my maiden plunge into the Peruvian Amazon. I had made it all of two sentences into my rambling monologue when the real six-legged tormentors of the Amazon discovered a 150-pound slab of meat, more accurately a slab of meat drenched in about a gallon of salty sweat, sitting there like a treetop all-you-could-eat buffet. It was a swarm of tiny sweat bees looking for a salty meal, and I was the meal they were looking for. Taken individually, or even in a swarm of a dozen individuals, the seemingly innocuous little sweat bee is nothing to worry about. Just a minor inconvenience in a landscape swarming with all kinds of critters that can ruin your day, if not your life, by taking a chunk out of you. The tiny black bees are about the size of a BB. They don't sting, and they don't bite, and they don't lay eggs in your privates. Instead, what they do is lick you, and they lick you everywhere that is not covered up with clothing. Of course, this means their favorite target is your face, which they assault in a boiling frenzy in search of their beloved perspiration, flying up your nose, into your mouth, down your ears, and worst of all, in your eyes, where they get hopelessly enmeshed in your tear ducts. I thought I had had it bad in Costa Rica when a dozen or so of these pesky little guys would get tangled in my beard. I wish... I was positively swarmed with dozens, if not hundreds, of the whiny little fuckers. The more I swatted them, the larger the crowd at the dinner table of my face grew. Writing was, of course, impossible, and within ten minutes of being discovered by the first little bee, I was driven from the treetops back to the ground where the sun 
never shines. So that explains our decision to abandon the canopy a million years ago. We just couldn't take the fucking sweat bees for one more day. I would have been the first one out of the tree. Oh well, it was about time for lunch anyway. And a quick epilogue uh, to that story, although it happened about a month after this tale ended, I actually got stung by a bullet ant uh, on my birthday. And uh, I, it, I assure you everything she said about that. Uh, good Lord, another story for another day. <clears throat> When I arrived at the lodge for lunch, I stopped by the tiny library, a little shelf of books for the tourists to borrow that sat approximately 30 feet from the table where I shared my lunch with Miranda and Kurtzita. I combed through the books until I found the one I was looking for, some kind of guide to Peruvian birds. I had a few minutes to kill before lunch, so I brought the book with me to the dining table and began thumbing through it in an effort to identify all the new birds I had seen in the canopy that morning. When the appetizer arrived, I set the book down beside me and began my meal. Miranda and I were sitting there chatting about our respective mornings, the bird book beside me on the table, when Kurtzita Rachetta waltzed into the room to take her seat at the head of the table. Where else? The three of us were sitting there eating our lunch, gabbing away about nothing in various shades of Spanglish, when the ever-alert Kurtzita, unless there's a two-pound rat in the dining room with her, spied the bird book. She did a double take, as if she had spied a scorpion heading her way. An icy scowl swept across her dark eyes, and she stared at the book, an obvious affront to her sense of propriety and decency, and a challenge to her position as the undisputed queen of Manu Wildlife Center. Where did you get that book, Samuel? She hissed at me in Spanglish, as if she were a cuckolded lover discovering I had cheated on her with her best friend. Uh, from the bookshelf, I answered, pointing about 30 feet from where we sat. But that book doesn't belong to you, she said, indig indignation rising in her voice. You need to put it back. I know where it belongs, Kurt Sita, I assured her. I went back to my meal. Samuel, you need to put that book back where you got it, Kurt Sita repeated. Obviously, this woman was not used to having her authority challenged so blatantly. I'm looking up some birds in it, I said. Jesus, woman, chill the fuck out. Once again, I returned to my meal as the tension at the table mounted. The book sat there 30 feet from its home on the shelf. Without another word, Kurt Sita got up from the table and stalked off into the kitchen. Not one minute later, a very sheepish Luis emerged from the kitchen, picked up the bird book from the table, and carried it back to the library, not daring to look my way as he did so. Miranda and I watched this whole drama in disbelief and burst into giggles. Well, I guess that's your daily scolding for today, Miranda said. You know, Miranda... The one kind of personality I don't know how to deal with is that kind of passive-aggressive shit. That woman has every person working in this place terrified. What do you mean, passive-aggressive, Miranda retorted. All I've ever seen is the aggressive. I said, at least I know now why Kurt Sita was so damned determined I was going to eat with her in the dining room instead of the staff kitchen. She wanted to make sure she could keep me under her thumb. I guess the famous bird book incident was the last straw. Kurt Sita Ratchetta never shared a meal with me again. I was officially on her shit list. I'm surprised 
It took five days to tell you the truth. After lunch, I settled into a comfortable, sweat-be-free chair in the screened lodge and plunged into one of the most terrifying descents of my entire journey into the 160 blank pages of a spiral-bound notebook that I was supposed to magically transform into a book about my travels to Peru, a travelogue that was somehow supposed to foment a planet-wide revolution of consciousness to bring this planet back from the edge of destruction. If you haven't figured it out by now, this is the result of that plunge. The next 55 days of my life in the jungle were now pretty much set. Wake up at 8, coffee for breakfast, Playa de Mariposa at 9, canopy tower from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m., gourmet lunch at noon, nose to the grindstone writing from 12.30 to 4 p.m., back to Playa de Mariposa until the tourists abandon the tower, evening bowl and cocktail for sundown over the treetops from 5 to 6.45 p.m., gourmet dinner at 7 p.m., English class at 9 p.m., bedtime for Bonzo and Boa at 10.30 p.m. Not a bad way to knock off a couple of months on the spiritual path for 10 bucks per day, as long as I could tolerate the walking on eggshells negative energy that emanated from my new nemesis, Kurtzita Ratchetta. My great stoner discovery that day did not take place in the actual canopy platform, but on the spiral staircase leading up to it. As it did with so many other aspects of life, cannabis made the trip up and back down the winding staircase a magical adventure. The great thing about a 10-story spiral staircase in the Amazon jungle is that with each wind around the center pole, your perspective on the surrounding world changes dramatically. One second, you're looking into the wild riot of palm fronds exploding from a palm tree 20 feet to your east. One second later, you're gazing upon the lichen-covered giant tree trunk of the kapok that the stairs are scaling. It was, in fact, this spectacular 100-foot-tall, 8-foot-thick slab of lichen-encrusted lumber that kept me mesmerized for more than an hour as the soft light of sunset faded and the even paler glow of moonlight moved in to take its place. It was a masterfully sublime performance of subtlety and nuance that I am convinced I never would have recognized if I had not been A. stoned and B. alone. Center stage of my stoner meditations and the crack between the worlds was a thigh-thick vine, I believe a young strangler fig making its initial assault upon the jungle giant that did not wind around the tree but grew straight up its edge. Perhaps 80 feet up the trunk, this giant lichen-spangled vine looped out from the trunk for reasons I could not figure out in the almost underwater soft glow of the setting sun and rising moon. This six-foot loop morphed into a pale blue diamond-studded anaconda that looked all the world like the blue anaconda spirit that opened my first ayahuasca vision a year ago. As I sat there on the stairway to heaven, gazing intently at the blue anaconda, the vine began to expand with energy, swelling and contracting with the breath of the forest. 
I could swear I could see the loop of solid wood beginning to writhe and coil, not eight feet in front of my eyes. My magical meditation was shattered by a movement in the treetop some 30 feet above me. Some animal, obviously a mammal, was working its way through the moonlit canopy heading toward the platform. I made it up to the platform at the same minute he made it down and we met face to face. Shining my flashlight on the totally tame little night creature not eight feet in front of me, I was thrilled to spot a pink-nosed, bug-eyed, furry little face that could have melted the heart of a planet eater. This face and head was attached to some little critter about the size and shape of a wiener dog, but with longer legs. Stretching out behind the blonde-haired little beastie was an 18-inch long furry tail. The little guy, who I later identified as a kinkajou, a distant cousin of the raccoon, was busy sticking his nose into every leaf, nook, and cranny he could find in the tree. Though I couldn't figure out whether he was sniffing out bugs or more vegetarian fare. Strangely enough, he was completely unaffected by the beam of my flashlight, and I almost felt like he appreciated the assistance it offered to his search for dinner. The kinkajou stopped a couple of times and peered at me with his beady little eyes, but after perhaps five minutes, he scooted on up the tree and into the moonlight, off to do whatever kinkajous do with their lives. I took this as my cue to pack it up from the canopy and let the moonlight guide me back to the lodge to do whatever volunteer English teaching spiritual warriors do with their lives. Four hours later, I was stretched out below the one remaining mosquito net in Boa, gazing out at the moonlight and drifting off to sleep to my lullaby of cricket song. That brings us to the end of chapter 12, heading into chapter 13, Canopy Breakdown, coming right up.